Sound check. One, two, three. Sound check. Hi. We want to thank Christian Hammer and the other organizers for letting us contribute by video. We're sorry we couldn't make it to Beijing, and we hope you're all having a great time there. We're the Programming Languages Group at Brown University, and we've been working on JavaScript for several years. We got started back in 2006 with Flapjacks, a reactive language built atop JavaScript, and have since moved on to semantics, analyzers atop these semantics, and applications of these analyzers. All our work is open source and actively maintained, and helps lower barriers to entry to doing research on JavaScript. In fact, several other researchers are using our tools too, including some of the people in this room. This talk is a brief introduction to what we have to offer. Before we dive into explaining our tools, I'd like to take a minute to remind us of why this work is necessary. JavaScript has become well known for its inscrutability and surprising behavior. In fact, its behavior is so unexpected that running programs at a console can accompany stand-up comedy. Here's a clip of Gary Bernhardt's Watt Talk, whose examples we'll use to show how our tools explain JavaScript's sometimes curious behavior. Take it away, Gary. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know in JavaScript what array plus array is? Well, let me ask you this first. What should array plus array be? Empty array, I would also accept type error. Uh, that is not what array plus array is. Wrong, <laughs> wrong. Array plus array is empty string. <laughs> Obviously, I think, that's, I think that's obvious to everyone. Uh, now, what, what would array plus object be? This should obviously be type error because those are completely disparate types. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, no, close, no, far away. It's object. <laughs> right, right, nicely done. Now, of course, because uh, this is plus, so you can flip the operands and the same thing comes out. So if we do, what? No, that's just an object. Uh, if you do object plus array, you should get exactly the same thing, which as you can see, you do. <laughs> and finally, uh, the only one of these that's actually true is, uh, because you know you add arrays, you get empty string, that doesn't make sense. But an object plus an object is actually not a number, technically. Thanks to Gary for letting us use that clip. We should ask, why was Gary having so much fun with the plus operator? Well, here's the specification of plus in JavaScript. It's a 15-step algorithm written in English prose. Over half the function is helpers that convert to primitive values with some typecasting checks scattered around. And down in step 10, if you look really hard, there's even something about adding numbers there. With JavaScript this complex, we had to ask, is programming languages research even capable of untangling this mess? This problem is not unique to JavaScript. There are several big, complex programming languages out there. And the way that programming languages researchers usually tackle these big languages is by developing a core calculus for the essence of the language. Core calculi are tractable. They're amenable to proof. So we did just that. We developed LambdaJS, a small, tractable core calculus for JavaScript. Like any good core calculus, it fits on a slide, just about. But the JavaScript specification is over 200 pages long, so clearly this core calculus omits many, many details of JavaScript. For example, let's take a look at how LambdaJS accounts for prototype inheritance. These three reduction rules are the essence of prototype inheritance. If a program looks up a field that doesn't exist, JavaScript traverses the prototype chain. If the prototype is null, JavaScript returns the special value undefined. This is the essence of prototype inheritance in JavaScript, and LambdaJS models it exactly. But JavaScript programs use several other operators to manipulate objects. The new operator, the instance of operator, the this keyword, but none of those are in LambdaJS. Why not? Well, they wouldn't fit on the slide, so we threw them out. Seriously. LambdaJS is a model of the essentials of JavaScript. As Landon taught us several decades ago, the rest is detail. The new operator, the instance of operator, and all the other details of the full JavaScript language can in principle be desugared into LambdaJS. The thing we did is we actually implemented this desugaring function. With this desugaring function in hand, we can take JavaScript programs, such as this deceptively simple array plus array program from the Watt video, and make the hidden complexity manifest. What you're seeing here 
is the desugared version of array plus array. I'm going to step through this program to show how we get to the answer that Gary saw. The first thing we see is that we're binding a special variable called context to the global object. We're also binding a variable called this. This matches JavaScript's behavior of setting the global object as the default this binding and as the environment record for the top level. The value that global is bound to is defined in a separate file that implements JavaScript's runtime in pure Lambda.js. This gives us a clean separation between the desugaring process and the libraries that define JavaScript's behavior. As we step inside this expression, we see that it's desugared to an application of a function called primAdd. primAdd implements the specification of addition in Lambda.js. This Lambda.js code, again in the environment, corresponds to the 15-step algorithm we saw before. Stepping further into the expression, we see that the arguments to primAdd are elaborated array literals. Now, arrays in JavaScript are just objects that happen to have the array prototype, the length field, and a few other specific attributes. And again, we see that the methods of the array prototype are also implemented in the environment, which provides the shared prototype object and its behavior. Now that we've understood the desugared expression, let's see what happens when we actually evaluate this Lambda.js program. PrimAdd tells us to invoke the array.toString method on each of these objects to get back a primitive value. Array's toString method concatenates all the elements together with commas in between. For an empty array, this means you get back the empty string. So, we end up with two empty strings, one for each argument. PrimAdd checks the first of these for its type to pick the operation to perform. Since it's a string, string append is chosen, and the two empty strings are concatenated to result in the empty string that Gary saw at the end. Even this tiny example required prototype lookup, type testing, and a choice of primitive operations. There are many other JavaScript programs in the world more complicated than this one. We might wonder, how does Lambda.js fare? We've designed Lambda.js and built desugar. A basic question we should ask is, is desugar a total function? For all JavaScript programs E, is desugar V defined? Since Lambda.js is so small, it's easy to write a little 100-line Lambda.js interpreter, and we did that. Unfortunately, JavaScript has implementations too. So the burden is on us to show that our answer is the same as their answers. That is, does Lambda.js produce the same results as actual JavaScript implementations? We engineered Lambda.js and DSugar so that for a portion of the Mozilla JavaScript test suite, Lambda.js produces exactly the same results as real implementations. This gives us confidence that Lambda.js is an accurate model of reality, and we can confidently build all our other tools atop Lambda.js. The semantics that we've presented for JavaScript so far is just one piece of a broader suite of tools we are building for JavaScript. We like to think of this suite as comprised of three layers. At the lowest level are these semantics, which lay the foundations for any subsequent analyses. Above these are tools, which implement general purpose analyses for JavaScript programs. For instance, we might be interested in computing control flow information, or trying to type check scripts. Built atop these analyses are special purpose applications that are designed to analyze specific real-world programs or libraries. The most significant tool we've built on top of Lambda.js is the strobe type checker for JavaScript. There are two novel research contributions underlying strobe. First, Flow typing augments the type checker with support for patterns of control and state. When JavaScript programmers use type testing and assignment to distinguish types in their programs, the type checker is sensitive to those operations. Second, JavaScript lets programmers use arbitrary strings in field lookup and assignment. We built support for string patterns and first class field names into Strobe to handle these uses. Both type testing and first class field names show up in other scripting languages like Ruby, Python, and Lua. The contributions of the strobe type checker aren't unique to JavaScript, and could be applied there as well. In the process of constructing strobe, we've built a few reusable components that are nice to have in our toolbox now. For example, we needed to have type annotations for our type checker carried from JavaScript down to Lambda.js. So we came up with a stylized comment syntax that lets us put the type annotations in JavaScript and build up annotated syntax trees. Second, we've built CPS and ANF transformations for Lambda.js 
to get the code in a form that's more amenable to certain kinds of control flow analyses. Equipped with Strobe, we were able to verify the AdSafe JavaScript sandboxing library. The expressiveness of objects with first-class field names let us encode the reference monitor-like checks of AdSafe in our type system. Then, we used flow typing to prove that the AdSafe runtime library enjoyed those properties. So this was our first trip through this stack of semantics to tools to applications. But one thing that we're really excited about is that at all levels of this stack, other researchers have managed to build on what we've done. We've seen people extending the semantics of Lambda.js. We've seen people building on top of our semantics, creating new tools. And we've seen people taking existing tools and going out to tackle new applications. So this is really great. But just ourselves, we're not done yet either. The original version of Lambda.js was built for ECMAScript at version 3 of the spec, but JavaScript itself is a moving target. In the S5 project, we're working to update the semantics of Lambda.js for the new spec, ECMAScript 5. This involves supporting the new styles of objects that they're introducing, which have getters and setters, for example, as well as addressing some things that we didn't get to in original Lambda.js, like a val. There's an official conformance suite that comes with ECMAScript version 5 that's getting more robust every day, and we pass a little over half of it right now. So we intend for S5 to be the platform for our current and future research on JavaScript. All of this work with JavaScript is useful in understanding how web programs work. However, JavaScript does not function in isolation, but rather within the framework of the browser environment. In order to gain a better understanding of what's happening in a web program, we therefore need to know what's happening in the DOM. To that end, we've created a formal model of the DOM events. Using this model, we can simulate the execution of HTML in the DOM. Like Lambda.js, we can run these simulations alongside actual executions in browsers to see how the programs compare to the expected outcome. By running such tests in Firefox, Chrome, and Explorer, we found instances where the behavior of the browsers was inconsistent, both with respect to one another and with respect to the specification as well as places where the specification itself is contradictory. Taken along with Lambda.js, this model presents a fuller picture of the execution of web programs. Like Lambda.js, S5 is suitable as a framework for building JavaScript tools. We are using it to build a symbolic evaluator with Eric Tanter. Again, S5 lets us focus on the semantic constructs of the language and ignore the syntactic noise. We've also begun pushing our work in yet another direction. Now that we have a semantics, we might also ask more formal questions, such as, is our semantics deterministic? Or, does our interpreter always make progress? To address these questions, we've formalized our semantics using the Cock Proof Assistant. Our model encodes the semantics, and we have formally proven that it does not get stuck. This formalization yields yet more confidence in our model, while the Cock encoding provides another entry point to our tool suite. And finally, our most recent project involves enhancing the strobe type checker to decide security properties of Firefox extensions, in particular whether they behave correctly within private browsing mode. We've presented several tools today. They're all open source and actively maintained. The website also has our papers on this material. We also blog frequently and in a less academic tone. We take technical support seriously and would be happy to help you get started with our tools to tackle JavaScript. Thank you and we look forward to hearing from you.